I'm Nicole Appel, primary care provider, uh, first and foremost, and definitely have a passion in preventing uh, disease through safe mechanisms. And it's just, you know, it's, it's always terrible, of course, if you miss that opportunity to prevent disease and uh, and result in a poor outcome. I don't have anything to disclose. So basically for this talk, I wanted to kind of delve into the history of vaccination because um, it's sort of interesting how we kind of got here uh, with these amazing tools to prevent disease, uh, to talk a little bit about a vaccine. And then of course, because you can't talk about vaccination without talking about the immune system, we'll be kind of touching on the immune system, what that is about certain illnesses, um, not in depth, but to understand them somewhat, and then some updates on new recommendations uh, for a number of vaccines and um, touching on inequity, uh, you know, sometimes with the trust in the medical system um, and the importance of uh, receiving vaccines in a timely fashion in order pre to prevent disease. So um, I got to delve into this a little bit uh, in learning about this talk. It's not something that I had, you know, we had really studied so much, but it was very, very interesting to talk about the history of where we, you know, where we came uh, to with vaccination. Um, smallpox um, was a devastating disease, of course, for all of human history, uh, you know, the mummies uh, in Egypt have marks of a smallpox-like illness. Um, uh, you know, it's been described early um, in the 300, 200s, 300s uh, in Asia and in other places. So something that humanity had been dealing with for thousands of years. Uh, and uh, people had, you know, it was a 20% of people died. Sometimes estimates are actually higher than that. Uh, and those that didn't uh, were often left with, you know, scarring, of course, sometimes blindness, mm -hmm. the, um, the pox uh, resulted in eyesores. Those could lead to, to blindness. Um, and people were, were trying. So uh, it seems like independently through history, um, different groups came up with ideas on how to do this. And the, the way that people were um, trying to, pr to protect themselves uh, from smallpox was this practice of inoculation, which was going on for hundreds of years. Uh, they would actually put some smallpox, nothing, they, they didn't know how to weaken a virus. They didn't have any of our biotech tools to you know, isolate proteins or different portions of the virus. They just used uh, actual virus itself and put a small amount. So the, the difference was the quantity of exposure uh, into someone's skin. So under the skin uh, to, to try to uh, develop immunity. Um, and this, it was effective and it um, did result in lowering um, the the death rate from smallpox, but it of course was dangerous because someone could actually develop smallpox itself. And there was nothing to say that that episode of smallpox couldn't then start an epidemic. So if you did that in isolate, you know, and you had a not immune population around that person and the next person gets smallpox, now you can start an epidemic across uh, that whole population. So it was a, it was a dangerous um, uh, uh, means, but the only one that people had come up with. Um, the, uh, this was, you know, smallpox was a disease that you got once. So our immune system, uh, learned enough basically through that one case of smallpox that you wouldn't, um, develop future cases if you were exposed again. And people knew that for a long time, that people who had had smallpox were then protected and could care for, uh, people who had smallpox, uh, safely without being concerned that they could, um, get ill themselves. And this, you know, also has uh, this picture is from uh, the smallpox that epidemic coming to uh, the Americas, which is, you know, a terrible um, uh, part of the history of smallpox, uh, with devastating, you know, in a, in a completely um, uh, novel population. They, uh, so the um, indigenous people of the Americas had not seen smallpox, and this had a lot to do with what happened uh, with the colonization of the Americas. This is uh, Lady Mary Worthley. Um, she basically um, had smallpox herself, got, you know, and she apparently was a quite beautiful woman and got significant scarring. And her brother also died from smallpox, so was very motivated to find ways. Um, Europe had been uh, sort of behind the times in, um, in the inoculation and, and hadn't, uh, hadn't started this inoculation process. Um, and uh, Lady Mary Worthley, she actually brought this back to Europe, had her own children vaccinated, had, uh, and because she was um, her married to the 
ambassador to Istanbul where they practiced this. She kind of learned about it and realized she wanted to protect her family. And that actually got interest with the court physicians to start experiments on, you know, doing this in Europe where um, eventually uh, Dr. Jenner would be inoculated himself, get a, a very mild case of smallpox when he was 10, and then develop the smallpox vaccine. This was, of course, before, you know, informed consent and all that. So they experimented first on prisoners and then, you know, uh, but eventually, you know, the entire war, war, all the royal families, people were requiring vaccination of their soldiers because they realized that um, this was so protective for, um, uh, and it was actually some of the first, like, like randomized trials of like looking at like we're going to give these people small the inoculation these people not and see uh was actually um during this time and that's like a um probably the way that scientists and doctors now know about how to tell which, whether something's working and that's actually um was in the time of smallpox that that first occurred so dr jenner um He's credited. Uh, he, you know, he wasn't the first person to think necessarily of this idea. We don't think that um, chicken pox, so uh, chicken pox, so that the cowpox virus could be related to smallpox and perhaps protective. Um, so many people had uh, had thought of this before. There was reports of other um, physicians doing this, but he was the person who kind of advocated for this to be standard of practice and advocated enough that um, it did become practice standard for um, for Egypt and then uh, for uh, England and then all across Europe, uh, people started vaccinating against smallpox. Um, I actually learned this during the uh, looking up for this call, but vaccination actually comes from vaca. So like in Spanish or uh, in Latin, that's for cow. So uh, the the reason that we say vaccination is actually because of cowpox um, and that we you know, they were using cowpox instead of um, smallpox to do inoculation in a safe manner. So cowpox is a very kind of related virus, but it's um, safe for humans because it didn't result in such systemic you know so it did while it caused sores in the place where you um, you put uh, the the virus, it didn't result in you know, having a, the entire body get sick. So you'd get the sores and you would recover. Um, and so uh, it was a much, much safer form uh, than inoculation, which could result in people getting systemic smallpox and perhaps spreading it or um, themselves getting sick and dying. Um, he actually never, uh, so, you know, vaccines have gotten super expensive. If many of you uh, may have, have realized, um, and um, like our newer vaccines, especially. And uh, he never benefited in any way from this, like an advocated, it was, oh, he got paid for his own medical practice, but he had like a private vaccination clinic that he ran out of his living room uh, where he would vaccinate people that couldn't uh, afford vaccination otherwise. Um, and uh, kind of is a, a hero for, um, for vaccination. Uh, and you know, quite a, quite a story. Uh, this is apparently in. Uh, I got this from Twitter, in fact. But uh, but they said th this is from the people that um, at Dr. Jenner's house. They have a number of uh, things about smallpox, uh, and basically with the story that how um, the difference between if you know vaccinated inoculation and uh, and exposure, and both kids had had smallpox, but um, one of them did well, and of course the other one had a very severe uh, severe case. And we know that you know. This was quite a success because smallpox was eradicated. Um, this is the World Health Organization um, uh, magazine that's uh, announcing, you know, in, in 1980, you can see up there uh, that uh, smallpox uh, was eradicated. So quite a success and quite exciting. Um, so what, what are we talking about? What is a vaccine? So you basically, you take some portion um, and luckily today uh, we have the ways, so Back then, there, there wasn't ways to really change viruses so much. They were lucky that they found this related virus in animals. Uh, and, and there's like a cowpox, a horsepox. So there, there were other kinds of disease that did not cause systemic disease in people. But they were sort of just lucky about that. They weren't actually modifying um, the disease-causing agent at all because they didn't have the techniques um, 300 years ago to do that. Uh, but fortunately, now we're able to process um, uh, the whatever the disease forming thing that we're trying to, you know, the virus or bacteria, and we take portions of it often uh, that are not, you know, that don't cause disease, that can't cause disease themselves, but are able to sort of package it in a way that stimulates the immune system safely without causing uh, the illness itself. 
So to teach us to sort of teach our immune system, uh, you know, what is this thing and how to fight it if we are actually exposed to it. Uh, there's you know many portions of course of the immune system uh, and the, the we call the the helper cells and antibodies and memory cells those are all portions of the immune system um, and this I just got from Miriam Webster just to make sure that we were you know but what what is uh, um, you know what is an immune response what is a vaccine um, here so you know kind of a complicated picture but um, this, uh, we kind of see that needle up at the top there and the vaccine antigen. So that's the thing that we're trying to make the body fight against, anti-fight against. And you have that, that big purple thing with the arms uh, over there in the corner and that's a dendritic cell. So it kind of like helps to eat up the antigen, take it out from where it is in the body. And then it presents it to our immune system using special proteins. And those, those proteins and on the antigen basically tell the immune system, hey, this looks like it's something that we shouldn't, we should, we should do something about. And then the T cells come over and they start a response. Uh, we make a B cell and we make these antibodies. So antibodies are the thing that we often like um, when we're trying to test people for immunity, we're often testing somebody's antibody. Um, we don't do that for all things, but if uh, someone we need to, uh, that's the easiest thing to test in the immune response to like to see whether or not, because they kind of float around in our bloodstream. And so they're accessible, whereas these T cells and memory cells are sort of deeper and harder to access. Um, and, you know, it's never an all or nothing, like nothing is really, right? So even if you have an antibody with, you know, you can, of course, uh, develop, uh, you know, an illness. So like, while you know, immunity, uh, it's relative immunity, because we're, we're never completely protected from, uh, from anything. Um, and so nothing works 100% of the time. Uh, but this, you know, greatly, greatly increases uh, protection, and most of our vaccines work extraordinarily well to prevent disease. So just some, some definitions that we kind of talked about briefly, but the antigen, we talked about uh, with the thing that we're trying to fight against, the antibody, the thing that's made by our B cells uh, to, um, uh, to, to to fight against whatever it is that we're trying to build against. And then attenuated is like our word for weakening something. So oftentimes we, um, as we, we, either we have like something where we're able to just take a portion and we actually are not using anything live at all, or uh, many of our vaccines, especially in the early models of vaccines were attenuated forms. So they were actually still live. Uh, they could cause disease, but they were in a much, much weakened state. So they wouldn't, um, they generally wouldn't uh, cause disease, but we're fortunate in that um, the majority of our vaccines today are actually not live uh, and they, they can't cause the disease that we're there, um, that they're fighting. All right, so this is just um, like a big picture about like the different ways that we make vaccines, um, but the polysaccharide, they're basically different proteins on the top there. Sometimes you'll use just the toxin. So you'll use the toxin and you'll, you'll modify it so it can't make people sick. Um, there is, sometimes you'll use the whole uh, disease, but you'll, you'll process it in a way that it can't cause disease anymore or that it's very unlikely to. And so some just different ways, different mechanisms that we've uh, tried over time to make all of these different vaccines. Um, so, you know, there is, the CDC actually gives a new recommendation around vaccines uh, annually. So they meet regularly and they, um, they decide together uh, with um, ACIP, which is a group basically of doctors, pharmacists, researchers, and um, also like members of the public who um, uh, kind of consumers uh, to come up with a series of recommendations uh, for uh, for the year and uh, and like evaluate the evidence of anything new that's come out in the last year or any new evidence to try to uh, make sure they're always giving the best and the you know uh, recommendations to everyone. And we'll we'll talk about some newer recommendations uh, for this a little bit later on. But this is a great resource to um, to see if you have any questions about vaccines. Their um, their website is is very very informative. So um, this is ACIP and this is what their websites are. And you, you can like all of their information is very public and very transparent so that you can have as much information as you'd like about, um, about vaccines. And we get these big tables and our job is basically to 
to put this into a way that is modifiable. So especially as a primary care provider or in, as part of my job is in quality and we try to put this into things like at UCSF, my chart, uh, which is our way to communicate with our patients, but and um, and Epic, which is our medical system, we basically, there are little reminder tools to patients and to providers to be like, this patient needs a flu shot. This patient is, you know, after 10 years, they need another tetanus shot. They need an ammonia vaccine, all the things that um, are recommended for them in a way that uh, makes it easy for everybody to stay um, up to date on their regimen. Um, and, you know, for travel, this was sort of a, a wish thing here, but uh, the um, I just put in Thailand as a place, but like, you know, you can actually go to the CDC and there, um, and you're, if you go to like a travel clinic or to, um, to your provider and like, I'm going to be traveling and I'd like to make sure that I have all of the necessary vaccines. Uh, this is probably the website that they'll go to. And, you know, it'd be, uh, it's a, it's always a wealth of information. It will tell you if like, there's anything that you should really know about and, you know, any, uh, new health information. They're always like, a like travel health notices. And currently there's nothing for Thailand there, but you, if there was, they would, uh, they would put that up there and then they go through all of the vaccines that you, uh, would either would be recommended for everybody, or maybe even for like specific populations. Like if you're working, you're going to be staying with friends or family. If you're going to be eating, if you're more adventurous, uh, um, and like, they'll try to help you get to the right, uh, vaccine regimen for you. This is, uh, the, so, you know, physicians we've been um, getting, I was put in some questions here just to, for our newer uh, updates, but uh, physicians have been getting this vaccine for a long time. Um, children have been getting it for a long time. And I asked like, which one is now expended to everyone uh, as a catch-up vaccine for everyone under the age of 60? Um, and it's, I put some options here, HPV, flu, hep B, H flu, or pneumococcal vaccine. And the answer for this was hepatitis B. So hepatitis B has been a universal vaccine for children for a really long time, for the last 30 years. So most of our 30 um, people, 30 and below are all immune, um, or at least have, have received the vaccine. About 5% of people won't actually respond to the vaccine. So sometimes need a second go. But um, you know, this is now expanded because it uh, is such an effective vaccine and helpful for a number of different things. Uh, so here it says that most people, the majority of people are not fully protected against hepatitis B and, um, and now it's, it's recommended so that, uh, we, um, we think about it for, for everyone. Um, what is hepatitis? So, um, hepatitis just means HEPA, right? Liver. And then itis means inflammation. And there's a lot of different things that are hepatitis. It doesn't mean actually viral. There's many things that are non-viral that also, that also cause hepatitis, but hepatitis B is a is a virus that causes inflammation to our liver um, and kind of sits there uh, for a long time, oftentimes completely asymptomatic. Most people with hepatitis B would have no idea that they were had any illness at all because um, it is completely asymptomatic for um, many, many, many people until it isn't. And by the time it isn't, um, unfortunately, the damage that the virus has done um, often cannot be re reversed. So it can cause things like um, scarring of the liver over time, um, also called cirrhosis. Um, and it can also cause liver cancer. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that, that obviously is is hard to treat. And this vaccine can actually prevent both that, those outcomes by preventing um, hepatitis B itself. So 2.2 million people, so a lot of people um, have this disease. Um, and as uh, up there, it says that 40%, right, can, can lead to really very, very significant outcomes that we would like to avoid, of course. It's very easy to spread. So actually, in if you get a needle stick, like um, this is actually the thing that's easiest to spread. Um, fortunately, and this is why physicians had been getting hepatitis B vaccines for so long is that we work with needles. And so sometimes uh, needle sticks are a occupational hazard for our profession. Uh, and so uh, hepatitis B vaccine has been required for us for a long time. Um, but of course, you know, other people can get it many other ways. This isn't spread like there's no like respiratory form of hepatitis. There's no, you can't eat it. And uh, like um, there are forms of hepatitis, like viral hepatitis that you can get from sharing food or drink with someone who's infected. Uh, but hepatitis B is not that. Uh, it's only spread through um, blood products or through sexual transmission. But it, uh, it's very, you know, very important to prevent. And uh, uh, now there's a way to do it. This is a really messy slide and I apologize, but, um, uh, but I thought it was 
uh, exciting and sort of interesting for why they're doing this is um, you can see that the like at the bottom you can see zero to twenty. There's like no very 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 few cases, right? So that that bottom light light blue is patients who are under the age of twenty. And basically there hasn't been any hepatitis B in that population uh, because we've been so effective at vaccinating. Um, the group that's slightly older, that is the dark blue. And those are the 20 year olds. So they, they're they now getting the benefit of the vaccine because you know they have gotten it now, but you know, 10, 20 years ago, they hadn't, not everyone who was in their twenties had gotten the hepatitis B vaccine. So we can see that it's actually working to decrease the levels of hepatitis B. And then we see that people in their thirties and forties and fifties uh, are in those higher levels. And they, uh, because we, we haven't been pushing vaccine um, except in select people who are at high risk for developing hepatitis B. Um, that this is the reason why now we're expanding the recommendations for this vaccine to age 60. Um, and there's a number of different ways to, to get it. Um, there's one new dose for it, Hepsilav, which is uh, just two doses, which is nice because hepatitis B is actually a three dose and had been for many years. And the um, Hepsilav is actually just a two dose regimen that you can complete one and then one at four weeks. Um, and many people were like doing this for travel. And you can imagine that if you're planning on, you know, going to Asia or Africa and then you forget, right, to come back because you're not going to get your six month one because usually you haven't thought that far in advance. So you haven't, you know, gone to your provider six months beforehand to get the whole thing. So many people would then forget when they got back. So I think the four week one, it, it'll be really helpful to get to getting people immune. And um, this was just, you know, from last year, but saying that, you know, sometimes even providers weren't yet aware there's a lot going on when the CDC made this recommendation to, um, uh, with you know COVID vaccine and um, uh, the pandemic itself, uh, so that uh, there was maybe less awareness of uh, this newer recommendation, um, and uh, we're only just starting to put it in like our quality uh, recommendations and our um, uh, reminder system for patients and providers, uh, partially because people wanted to make sure that everybody got COVID vaccine and the bivalent and all of that. And it's just a list. So, you know, you can get it after the age of 60. So if, if someone wanted to look and see, you know, if I do have risk factors for developing it, even if I'm um, over the age of 60, these are um, some things that might show that you are someone who, who should get it, even if um, you don't uh, meet it by age. And um, the way that a lot of people get hepatitis B, um, so you can see that actually here in the US, um, there are, so the light blue is like, um, lower levels of hepatitis B and the uh, darker blue areas are the um, uh, greater than 8%, so quite high seroprevalence of hepatitis B. Um, and the way most people, um, especially in countries of very high prevalence, get hepatitis B is through um, childbirth, is through um, when they're being born, they get it from their mother. Um, so it's uh, in in utero, like when the fetus is inside, they uh, it seems like the placenta does a very good job actually of protecting from transmission. But through the birth process, which you know there is obviously fluid exchange, um, uh, they um, uh, that they get infected at that time. Um, and we have uh, so in addition to like getting the vaccine, we we give it actually uh, at at birth basically. But if we knew that someone had a you know, had a mother who had hepatitis B, we actually can give like antibody to hepatitis B. And then like, so to make sure that we really make sure that we're decreasing the levels of hepatitis B in that baby system as soon as possible. And then we give the vaccine after that. Um, and people actually who get the hepatitis B um, during when they're being born, they, they actually, they, they very rarely have any symptoms at all, but they're very likely to live with the low levels of inflammation in their liver, and they actually are at very high risk for developing cancer, uh, which is a scary uh, outcome, of course. And this is to show that uh, basically that young people, um, this is for liver cancer, and you can see the ages here, it's six to nine years old. So it shows that like in, this is from Taiwan, but that in, uh, in, in places where there was very, very high levels of hepatitis B, uh, these children were actually at very high risk for developing liver cancer. We, we usually don't see it here um, until a little bit later, 40s, 50s of liver cancer from hepatitis B, but even these young kids were at high risk for, um, and the reason why uh, they were vaccinating you know, they're their children too. So, you know, um, everyone started basically universally vaccinated young babies. And that's why there was this huge difference in the populations of protection from liver cancer. So um, 
Another question, uh, what vaccine is newly available to immunocompromised patients to decrease complications of this very painful dermatologic disease? And Dr. Barron was uh, uh, talking about this a little bit earlier, but it's uh, shingles. So the shingles vaccine um, is now uh, available for anyone who's immunocompromised from 18 to 50. We've been giving it to people over the age of 50 for a long time. Um, but uh, uh, this now it's recommended uh, for these people that are under the age of 50 as well to further help um, prevent disease. Uh, so what is shingles? So it's a herp or also known as herpes zoster. Um, it's reactivation of this chicken pox virus. Um, it basically lives inside the spinal cord. So um, in your back uh, and can come out as shingles. The um, herpes part, um, so herpes, you've heard of herpes simplex maybe, which is the thing like cold sores or genital ulcers. And that's, that's a different virus, but they're in the same family. And the reason why people with cold sores get them again and again will throughout their life, uh, the same thing with people with um, genital herpes is because that same thing um, is true of the herpes simplex virus is that it lives in your body ongoing, um, protected in the nerves. Um, and this, uh, and that same thing happens for this uh, chickenpox virus. Um, and it's a very interesting rash uh, in that it comes out in what we call a dermatome, basically means the, the skin that is, um, you know, each one of these spinal nerves has a area that it innervates, that it, you know, feels the, and if you have pain in that area, it brings it back to the spinal cord. And so all the areas that that nerve is in charge of feeling and um, all of that actually is where the virus spreads. So it spreads all the way to the midline of the front and then all the way to the back. And it stops right in the back because um, it stops at the midline. So you have, you have one nerve going one way and one nerve going the other way. Um, and it's one of the characteristics of, uh, of shingles. Um, and it, it causes this painful rash. The, the rash itself, you know, generally lasts one or two weeks and then resolves. Um, some people are, um, especially immunocompromised people can get disseminated shingles, which is, um, can be quite uh, uh, dangerous. People have to be hospitalized uh, and it can cause death. Uh, so it can cause meningitis and cause a lot of things. Um, so um, most people fortunately will not have that outcome uh, who have a competent immune system, um, but they will have this, this bad rash and then they have this neuropathic pain um, and nerve pain is the worst, one of the worst pains that you can have because our like normal ways that our body deals with pain do not work. Uh, so all the ways that the body has to kind of turn down the signal, be like, yes, I know I burned my hand, but, um, but you know, it's not burning now. I don't have to do anything. Right. Cause pain exists to like, tell you to move your hand out of the fire and your body has ways once the damage has been done to be like, I realize there's an injury and I can start turning that down so that my, um, you know, I can do other things. Right. And then when it's nerve pain itself, so it's not an injury to my hand, but rather the nerve going to the hand that doesn't work as well anymore because the, the mechanisms actually, you know, the nerve itself is damaged or involved. And so, um, uh, makes it uh, very, very painful. And, uh, the shingles vaccine decreases the risk both of getting shingles, fortunately, and also that neuropathic pain. Is so one thing like that I'm really glad that they decided to do this is because uh, the uh, there was an in a, a live vaccine previously that um, people used to be worried about giving it to immunocompromised patients and now uh, you know this really emphasizes the fact that this is for the people that are most at risk for shingles right because um, generally chickenpox virus is in the spinal cord and it doesn't come out unless your immune system is compromised in some way either from time like age, for example, uh, or um, some kind of, you know, you get a medication uh, that affects your immune system. Stress can affect your immune system. And that's a big reason why people will come up with, come out with shingles or um, your, uh, you know, chemotherapy um, or anything that affects your immune system can, um, can cause shingles to come out. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's like 95%, it's 68% effective in immunocompromised patients because they don't, you know, immunocompromised patients are less likely to respond to all, all vaccines uh, just because their immune system, uh, by definition, is somewhat compromised, um, but they, uh, they do benefit greatly uh, from, the, from the vaccine. And this is just that Zostavax um, is no longer 
uh, it's not available in the U.S. Uh, that we don't have to worry about getting the live form of this. It, it doesn't exist here any longer after 2020. Um, and just again to say that some physicians didn't realize that this this had, and were worried. You know, can I give it in the case of immunocompromised? Yes, this is actually recommended. Um, and I feel like this new recommendation of recommending it specifically for immunocompromised people really highlights that uh, uh, that we should give uh, shingles for immunocompromised patients. So. Another question, what new vaccine was added to simplify, simplify a previously complicated regimen, flu, HPV, pneumococcal vaccine, monkeypox, or polio? And the answer is pneumococcal vaccine. So there was uh, a, a new uh, technology around pneumococcal vaccine uh, where um, they were able to conjugate uh, the vaccine and have multiple forms of the pneumococcal um, uh, polysaccharide in a vaccine so that we would be as protected as possible against pneumococcus. Uh, so pneumococcus is a bacteria now, so not a virus. Um, it is um, strep pneumo. Uh, it's not the strep you think about with sore throat, but are related, you know, all these sort of things are in families. So it's the, um, it's in the same family um, as the one that causes the bad sore throat, uh, but it um, is more likely to cause pneumonia, but it can also cause things like meningitis, um, uh, otitis media, sinusitis, even endocarditis. So um, it's something uh, that, uh, and it's also, it's sort of difficult to fight against for the immune system because the virus has a very, very thick wall. And so it makes it hard for the immune system to really uh, get at it, uh, which is why um, they really, we really wanted to have a vaccine. Um, there was a complicated history with this, like I alluded to before, because there's been a number of sort of rounds of pneumococcal vaccine, both in adults and kids, uh, since this also you know, affects children. Um, and in this, um, when you do a vaccine, you also start affecting what sorts of pneumococcus are in everybody, right? So even people who are not vaccinated, um, and uh, that sort of also affected the um, ACIP's recommendations around the pneumococcal vaccine. So some, some risk factors for having pneumococcal vaccine, and this is the polysaccharide that we were talking about before and how complicated it is. And basically it's like a very, very thick barrier for the immune system to go through. And we use some of those polysaccharides in order to make the vaccine. Uh, they conjugated it. And, you know, the, the real reason why that's important is because it used to be that this polysaccharide vaccine, the one that just had the, the little things up here on the wall, but wasn't conjugated. Conjugate means to join together, conjoin. Um, uh, the one that wasn't, didn't have that, didn't have another um, uh, protein to cause the immune system to really react, ended up causing very, uh, it caused, you know, helped prevent pneumococcal uh, uh, illness, but it would wane over time. Um, and so they were, uh, we'd have to give it every five years um, and was, was hard to provide lasting immunity. So when they, uh, they use this here, it's called uh, a carrier protein. And they basically use the tetanus uh, protein because that causes a strong immune response. Most of us have received um, our tetanus shot at some point um, that they use that to kind of link in and that caused a stronger immune response. And they um, there's um, at least at the current time. And of course, ACIP can always update their recommendations because they're always looking for more data uh, and they, um, more clinical data comes out, of course, every year. So they're always up updating. But at the current, if you get one of these conjugated PCV20 uh, vaccines, you're actually, um, uh, they, they think that you will not need further uh, pneumococcal vaccine and that'll be enough uh, for you. So you'll be um, protected uh, for a long duration. And this is the, here's the memory cell again, kind of hanging out there. So, you know, um, hard to, you can't really test whether those are around. So clinical data on that will be uh, forthcoming, I'm sure, over the next um, uh, several years. And this is just comparing these new vaccines. There was also a PCV15, um, which is also good, but it does require us two vaccine series. So it, um, it, isn't, uh, it isn't the one and done that PCV20 is. Um, uh, they do cause like some sight pain, um, like at the arm, basically some myalgias, um, fatigue, uh, but a very, very safe uh, vaccine and uh, very effective. And this is um, just 
so for, for your provider sometimes, actually this was complicated enough for your providers that they made, the CDC made an app <laughs> to be like, okay, people who got pneumococcal vaccine before, what's our recommendation now? Just because while it simplified the vaccine recommendations, people who have not had any vaccines since it was like, okay, one and done, PCV20, I'm done. Um, or you can see up here, PCV15 and PCV23 a year later, PPSV23 a year later, um, that uh, that some people, of course, had had some variation of the previous pneumococcal vaccines. And what do you do for those patients? The, this is a list of the uh, the recommendations. So most people can get um, the PCV20 um, uh, again. And then there's also like a shared de decision making for people who have completed the whole series and are over the age of 65, but still want to protect themselves more. Uh, there is an option to, you, it's not like you can't get it, but it, it's not it's not required to do the PCV20 for all patients. Um, so shifting gear a little bit for some other um, vaccines that are, uh, so HPV has been challenging to, um, uh, to give universally, uh, especially COVID has really affected the distribution of the HPV vaccine. Uh, part of it's just the, uh, like that preteen uh, time. So uh, it's maybe harder uh, to catch kids uh, than the initial series where everyone's going to their, you know, pediatrician every two months, every four months uh, when, when the baby's just born. Um, but uh, we have had trouble getting to, getting these numbers up for HPV. Um, it is recommended uh, for um, all, all pediatrics. Um, and catch-up vaccine is recommended until age 26 uh, to decrease your risk for getting um, the papillomavirus. Um, human papillomavirus is the virus uh, which causes cervical cancer and some other kinds of cancer. So like certain types of throat cancer, for example, are caused by HPV. And this is um, a way to help prevent that. Uh, we, we didn't change anything with like the cervical cancer screening regimen. So those those remain the same, at least as current, for the people who've gotten HPV uh, vaccine and those who haven't. And again, ACVIP is always always looking out for for more rec uh, more data and more recommendations. So uh, this is like how vaccines affect non-vaccinated people. The, basically, the point on this one is that HP, like if you vaccinate people, and this happened for both pneumococcus and for HPV, especially when you're vaccine, vaccinated against, um, HPV comes in a lot of different types. And some of those types are very likely to cause cervical cancer or uh, genital warts, which is the other thing that um, HPV causes. The, uh, and the vaccine was specific against those types. Uh, so we you know, tried to get the most virulent, the worst ones into a vaccine, right? Um, and you can see like, uh, basically when they first start vaccinating, uh, there was like a huge difference, uh, in vaccinated and unvaccinated people, but actually over time, the number of those, the, the type of HPV that was bad actually goes down in everybody. Right. So even the vaccinated people are actually helping to prevent this, these types of HPV to, in spreading in the non-vaccinated folks. Um, sort of like getting, you know, your flu shot, not because, because you're, you know, you're worried about yourself and you want to miss work and stuff like that, but maybe you're also trying to protect, you know, your, uh, newborn at home or, uh, someone who's pregnant or your, you know, grandparents or someone who is, uh, has a weaker immune system than you. Uh, and similarly getting vaccinated actually helps to protect others. And in this, we see that, uh, the same thing is happening where, um, the, the more virulent subtypes are going down in the population because of that. Talking about uh, flu, uh, flu vaccine. So recommended for everybody uh, over the age of six months, uh, unless there's a severe contraindication. Um, uh, severe, per, you know, you can be allergic to anything, right? You can be allergic to strawberries, you can be allergic to peanuts, and you can be allergic to a flu vaccine. That's true for any of the vaccines, right? That these are chemicals and you can uh, become allergic to any component, right, uh, of them. Um, egg allergy, uh, people were worried about that for a long time. It seems that the rate of allergic reaction is, uh, um, is, is, is very, 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 very low. And so, um, uh, the only difference is they recommend that you get your vaccine at a place that where they could, um, if you ever were to have a reaction. So if you had a severe allergy, they say, get it at your doctor's office. So, you know, 
the flu vaccine is never a hundred percent effective as many, um, many of you have realized, I'm sure in getting your flu shot and then having, and then getting a flu virus. Um, of course, you know, there's many viruses that are not the flu that cause in like flu like symptoms. And of course, flu, the, you know, influenza vaccine doesn't prevent against any of the viruses that are not flu. Um, and also it doesn't prevent against all strains of flu. So influenza changes very like, um, a lot every year. So every year there's been, there is a huge shift in uh, where, you know, huge, uh, but enough to confuse your immune system shift uh, in the types of flu that are around. And so uh, they're, um, they need to make a new one every year. And that's why uh, to, uh, to match uh, the flu vi viruses that are likely to be prevalent within that season. Um, there's um, for people over the age of 65, um, uh, there's a slight decrease in immunity as we get older. And so um, over the age of 65, they have a higher dose. So they give more, more vaccine basically. And you uh, you then get better immunity uh, for, for people over the age of 65. It, you know, it can make you have more of a sore arm and stuff like that. So that um, it does cause a little bit of more local reactions because it is um, like uh, twice the dose basically of the, um, of the flu vaccine. Okay, so COVID vaccine, just these are uh, the types, uh, as you know, that are approved or authorized in the US. Um, it is steeply, steeply reduced the risk of death uh, from COVID uh, and the risk of going you know, to the hospital, needing a breathing machine, um, uh, those terrible things that we you know, were unfortunately really used to seeing in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, now are, are you know, still happen, of course, but are much, much less than they were previously. And the bivalent vaccine also re reduces the risk of death um, the and slightly reduces the risk of infection. Um, uh, we do, uh, people are still getting, you you know, it doesn't completely prevent, no vaccine completely prevents. Um, and it seems like the COVID vaccine um, prevents death really well. Um, and this is a, you can kind of see the black line on top is the people who are not vaccinated and it's how often they die from COVID. And then that light blue line is the people who have gotten vaccinated, but they haven't had their booster yet. So, uh, and you can see there's a huge difference, right? In the number of people who are dying that's on a list, like incidents per hundred thousand people, um, uh, a huge difference between uh, the risk of death if you've been vaccinated and if you have not. And then that green line, which you know only started more recently is actually the bivalent, right? So last fall, there was this uh, bivalent vaccine uh, that became available and, um, you know, not uh, not as much of a difference as a, as a gap uh, as with the people who have not been vaccinated, but still there is additional protection you can see there of, um, again, the outcome here was death. Uh, so not not getting COVID and surviving uh, or hospitalization, but, um, but, but, you know, uh, a very hard outcome of uh, uh, of dying from the disease. So we can see here that uh, there's a basically tenfold uh, lower risk of dying from COVID uh, when you compare to people who are not vaccinated. Um, and then this additional 2.5 decreased risk uh, from the bivalent vaccine. And this data, by the way, is from the CDC uh, COVID data tracker website. It's uh, put the little but they they have a huge amount of data there. So for people who are interested in kind of learning more about their own communities, uh, they have it by county. They have it um, so you can kind of uh, learn more about uh, COVID vaccine um, near you. It's just a little bit of recommendation around the COVID vaccine itself um, and the information about bivalent uh, uh, the bivalent vaccine and the decrease. Um, you know, imp improved immunity, basically, to the newer strains, because like flu, COVID keeps changing new strains all the time. And so um, uh, this is, um, you know, further protect pr protective. And so how are we doing on um, vaccination? I'm in San Francisco. So uh, in San Francisco itself, the you know, for, we always do better. We've been, we've been concentrated first, right, on our older population. Our older population also, um, Kind of recognizes their own level of risk because uh, age is the biggest risk factor for um, for for death from COVID and from um, becoming truly seriously ill from COVID. And so the you know uh, at least one dose, ninety five percent, ninety two percent, and then the updated bi bivalent less, uh, but sixty percent. Um, and then we see for our adults, 
uh, that 90% is good compared to other places, uh, that 90% uh, of people have been vaccinated. Uh, kind of similar for um, the, uh, the uh, above 12 and above five, and then the 40% of patients getting the bivalent where we are now. So more, more room for improvement, uh, especially since we saw that it does, you know, actually decrease death uh, from the disease. So certainly more room for improvement there. And this was uh, from the New York Times. So basically like, you know, like we said, no, nothing is completely into 100% successful. Um, uh, so you can have the vaccine and you can get sick from COVID or from other, uh, you can get it from uh, none of, no no intervention is 100% ever. And this is the Swiss cheese model, which probably many of you have heard of, but the, the idea behind the Swiss cheese model is basically that um, there are multiple layers between a bad outcome and the person we're trying to protect. Oh, you, maybe you, maybe maybe me. Um, and we uh, we try to make sure that we have enough things that work well enough and that none of the things uh, uh, result in it coming all the way through to me. So, you know, staying home, this is someone staying home if they're sick, maybe wearing a mask if they're out, uh, hand hygiene, limiting your time in crowds, ventilation, air filtration, quarantine, isolation, and then, uh, and then vaccination are the ways that we're, um, you know, helping to prevent uh, illness spreading. And uh, this is just that, um, you know, are we in the clear, you know, um, so uh, the CDC also it does wastewater sampling. This is a way to like see kind of before people maybe even start testing positive, because actually the testing rate is not going up yet, but um, sometimes this can be an indicator of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, maybe like people testing at home and not coming in because they don't, we don't always you know, someone, if you do a home test and you're positive and you stay home and you isolate and you never tell your doctor, we actually don't get those numbers. They don't necessarily go into the, they don't go into any national reporting um, system necessarily. Um, and so this is a way to, to kind of see, and sometimes this does mean that there is an indication that, um, uh, that we, we may see more cases um, later, but we can see kind of an uptick in the um, concentration of, uh, of COVID in our wastewater. Uh, this is for San, uh, San Francisco and San Mateo. And you can look, if you're not in the San Francisco area, you can look um, at that same website, the uh, wastewater surveillance website, um, and just put your county and they, they're they doing it for um, for a number of areas. There's some people that, that, that don't have the facility, but if, if you're in one of the areas that have a facility, uh, they, uh, they're they doing the sampling. Uh, and this is just where we are in terms of cases and deaths uh, from COVID. You can see it for the country on the same website. You can see it, um, uh, but we're in terms of deaths and weekly cases. We're actually we have we are not going up right now. Um, so uh, if I didn't have that other data, uh, things are looking uh, pretty good. Um, this is just you know to if you wanted to see like for me particularly if I have a health condition you can also go to that CDC website and uh, figure out whether or not what kind of vaccines are are available for you. A little reminder about pregnancy. So pregnant people, you know, should get many you know uh, vaccines previous to pregnancy. The things we do that are special for pregnancy, uh, uh, you do flu is actually very very dangerous for pregnant women. Um, during pregnancy, there is a, a decrease in immunity uh, that is like intentional by the mother's body to um, uh, ensure that there's no uh, antibody responses that could be dangerous to the fetus. Um, because if that happens, of course, you can reject uh, the fetus. So they actually tone down the immune system of the pregnant woman for the duration of pregnancy. And so colds are harder to get over and flu, it, which is you know, uh, can be dangerous anyway, but can be particularly dangerous uh, and uh, during pregnancy and, and even result in um, hospitalization, uh, ICU or death. Um, so uh, so flu is really important in pregnancy and every everybody um, who's pregnant uh, needs to get a flu vaccine. Um, we actually, the Tdap, uh, tetanus, diphtheria and pertussis, which we, we haven't really talked about, um, but is a uh, is a vaccine that we give regularly and then we repeat every 10 years. Um, tetanus is very, very rare. Uh, I've seen it once in my entire uh, medical career. 
but uh, uh, pertussis, which this also has, so the P in that is three vaccines, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis is actually pretty common. And we'll see, you know, we see it a lot. And for babies is actually very, very dangerous. And we give it to the mom to protect the baby so that when um, the baby's born, they actually already have, because the, they get the immunity from the mother while they're um, and then also if the woman decides to breastfeed, they'll also uh, receive the antibodies in the breast milk. So it'll protect the baby uh, where their own immune system is too young to respond to any vaccine. And, you know, they wouldn't have gotten this vaccine anyway. Um, they are actually uh, protected from the mothers uh, having gotten this vaccine. Uh, we do av avoid live vaccines. Like we were saying before, there's, there's, there aren't that many that we give, but uh, measles, mumps, and rubella um, are vaccines that we avoid uh, during pregnancy. Um, varicella, and then the live, there is a, there's a, there is a live flu, a nasal, like if you didn't like shots, there's a live flu, attenuated flu. Um, and then HPV, we, we just don't give it during pregnancy. It isn't approved for pregnancy. Immunocompromised, mostly just um, uh, to avoid the live vaccines, which um, luckily are are rare, but there still are uh, these few. Um, the the flu, of course, we want to give a flu shot to every single person who's immunocompromised. The zoster vaccine. Uh, so this says varicella, which is actually the chickenpox itself. Uh, but uh, like, so if you never had chickenpox, um, uh, you avoid that one. But you will not avoid the zoster vaccine that we talked about earlier. So the um, herpes zoster vaccine you can get, give because it is not live. Um, so this is just to take the, um, for your flu shot, use the inactivated one, um, which is the one, the shot that we give. This, this live one is is pretty hard to get in, actually pretty expensive if you, if you really want to get it. Um, and then uh, MMR, which most people just get when they're um, when they're young, although there was more attention to getting the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine recently with, um, you know, uh, measles cases, maybe like a year ago, people were really interested in checking their, uh, their immunity to make sure they were immune for, uh, to measles, um, and sort of an, uh, increase in awareness about the importance of that vaccine. So adverse, you know, adverse events can happen from, you know, a peanut or, uh, you know, a strawberry, if, you know, so you can develop allergic reaction or adverse reactions to many things uh, and allergic reactions to vaccines as well. And this is the, um, the vaccine adverse reaction uh, reporting website. It like, uh, and anyone can use it. So if you wanted to uh, report your own um, uh, adverse effect, you can. Um, so it isn't, it isn't like it's just providers who can provide this information. It's really easy. It's like online. You just put in the information uh, that you have. So it, it isn't something that requires any special information or, or, or anything like an MRN or a license number or anything like that. You, you just uh, put in the information that you have um, with your demographics and things like that. Um, uh, but this is like basically a way that we are always monitoring for possible trends in uh, adverse events, you know, especially was important for, you know, newer vaccines. This is really important uh, because maybe we are, we haven't yet been aware. We of course do extensive testing when we, um, for, for anything, uh, uh, the FDA has very, very high standards for what it will um, authorize or approve um, and requires a lot of testing, but that doesn't mean that there are things that we not realize about combinations of how it affects or, you know, when you do, you know, a million, millions of people, you end up realizing that this, this particular side effect may happen in these people. And so that's why it's really important to have continual data uh, monitoring uh, to understand what these, uh, what adverse reactions can happen. And so this is just what it looks like, you know, patient information, report information, facility information. Um, it is good to have the vaccine, whatever you, information you have on the vaccine, because uh, they kind of, they actually will try and trace information. Like, was there a bad batch? Was there something that went wrong with the processing of this? Like, uh, there are a lot of questions that they'd ask. So if you had information on like, you know, the, the serial number and all that, it'd be great if you don't have it and you can still put it in without that information. And just uh, switching um, a little bit to variability in vaccine coverage. So we do know, and especially recently, um, we've seen decline in a lot of uh, preventive service um, of all types, in fact, that required in-person um, evaluations, but um, vaccines particularly as well. Uh, worldwide, we saw a decrease um, because of COVID, you know, just decrease in 
the number of things, right? Supply chain issues, um, people, you know, isolating at home, not coming into a provider, um, all the childhood, um, it was hard to get childhood preventive service uh, appointments um, to happen in a regular fashion because people were were worried, were concerned about coming out. Um, and uh, there was just a number of reasons why people, uh, vaccine rates uh, declined um, universally uh, because of the pandemic and are certainly coming up now. Um, so, uh, you know, really, just essential. And, you know, that's, that's also true for things like mammograms and, uh, and, you know, a number of, you know, our patients like, you know, didn't came in at, you know, 2019 and then didn't come in. And then, uh, by the time they came in that they, uh, they had something that, you know, was, was no longer intervenable or was uh, more difficult to intervene upon. Um, so, uh, just, uh, there was this disruption in care. Um, but this shows is this is actually from before the pandemic, um, and just shows the you know that there even even before the pandemic there was variation in uh, the amount of vac in vaccine being given. This was for MMR vaccine, but it also kind of tracks for other vaccines too. Uh, and this was for young children, uh, so around three years old. Um, so when they're um, kind of supposed to have gotten at least one of the MMR vaccine and. Um, and you can see that across the, the U.S. there's variability in, in, in people receiving vaccines in a timely fashion. Uh, we also see that by race and ethnicity that there are some differences. Uh, this is for flu vaccine, but we can see that, um, you know, still low numbers, truthfully, for, for everybody here, um, but that uh, Black and Hispanic patients had lower rates. And we can see that um, also this um, maybe, uh, you know, I'm sure there may be other reasons as well, but that this is for ICU admission data for flu. And we can see that Black um, and uh, Hispanic patients have a higher rate of requiring ICU admission for influenza um, and, and uh, decreased vaccination um, could be part of why that occurs. Um, and this has been uh, something that we We've also seen is that just the uptake in uh, COVID vaccination, and we remember this graph from before, that it really, really, really impacts how likely you are to to die from COVID, right? So, um, uh, and like you know, early in the pandemic, we would see people have this very, very severe respiratory collapse that happens so quickly. Um, and you know that's much rarer now, especially that rapid respiratory failure um, is much much rarer uh, uh, this far out in the pandemic, uh, mostly because of vaccination. Um, and for people who have not been vaccinated, uh, they still really run that risk of having um, very very severe outcome, poor outcomes, um, including death. Uh, so really really important to get everybody vaccinated. But uh, so we can see there's differences in race ethnicity. Um, and just, you know, and trust about what, uh, what the vaccines are. Um, I didn't, I didn't put this in this chart, in the chart, but there's like a, in this, in this talk, but there uh, are many, you know, uh, people who worry about many, many things with these vaccines in particular, um, that someone like that they might be tracking information in them. I, you know, we've, we've all heard many, many uh, concerns uh, and they are very safe and life saving vaccines. Um, so uh, so important that we distribute them to as many people as we can. And this is just what, what we were saying before about the 5% decrease in uh, DTaP worldwide, uh, lowest that we've seen in 15 years, um, and decrease in wellness, well, wellness uh, visits to, especially for children in the US, 1% uh, decrease, which is huge uh, over a population for kindergartners being up to date in their vaccines. And some ways if like, you were worried about your friends or your family in terms of acceptance of uh, vaccine. Um, uh, I think we all have uh, family or friends that uh, may be worried about this vaccine or like, like COVID vaccine or all vaccines. Uh, in truth, we have there's a there's a large population of people in Marin uh, who who worry uh, about vaccines. Um, and you know, there's there's many. You know, it's, it's important to, uh, of course, we, we want to tell them that we believe in vaccines, but that we, uh, you know, to avoid judgmental language that like for me as a provider, trying to make sure that I hear um, everything that um, the patient's saying and thank them for telling me and then try to explain how I see it uh, and uh, try to develop the relationship and the trust uh, so that they would trust me to do 
all of the preventative serv service things that they need, including a uh, vaccine. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to do anything. And then sometimes it's like, I particularly am worried about this one thing. Um, and, and getting to the root of what someone is worried about can sometimes help to, to understand and then to, um, to be able to answer the question. Okay. And this is um, uh, by the Painted Ladies, actually, in San Francisco. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but basically says, you know, that we can... Uh, we can we can basically eradicate COVID and has like measles, rubella, polio down here, um, and these are just some some really great murals uh, to to inspire us all to uh, to especially for COVID, but uh, to help prevent disease by vaccination. So thank you so much. Just a summary. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the history of vaccination. What is a vaccine? To understand a little bit about our immune system and our and the infectious diseases that we're trying to prevent against in order to understand how these vaccines work. And the newer recommendations around a couple of vaccines uh, and awareness of disparities and, and ways to to help convince your friends and family um, uh, if, you, uh, if you felt like uh, you wanted to be part of that process to, to help them stay healthy and safe, knowing that you are helping that person and also everyone around them, right? Because they, um, many of these diseases can be asymptomatic for some time at least, right? Um, uh, the way that COVID spreads so quickly is because there's a period of time before a person's sick and they're, you know, shedding virus and they, um, while they have no symptoms whatsoever, and they they often then develop symptoms in the future, but they, um, they are spreading the virus before they're ill. Or sometimes, you, you know, especially flu, you can get you can have an asymptomatic case of flu and spread it to your friends and loved ones without realizing it. And uh, vaccines actually decrease the risk of that asymptomatic carriage of a uh, virus uh, as well. So um, do help protect um, you, know, you, your friends and family, your community. Um, so, uh, so hopefully to realize the importance of what you're doing for, for everyone uh, um, in protecting yourself uh, from these diseases. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. First thank of all, you. thank you very much for doing that. That was a terrific summary. Uh, lots of new information and, and lots of important uh, older information, too. Uh, let me start with one um, that a patient asked me the other day. Um, what is the difference between, this is for a zoster. So what is the difference between having had a case of chicken pox as a kid and getting zoster in terms of risk versus having had the chicken pox vaccine and getting zoster. Can you get zoster uh, if you've never had chicken pox but have had the chicken pox vaccine? Um, it's a very good question. So um, unfortunately, the so it would be amazing if that if the chicken pox vaccine if somehow it, it didn't, but it, it actually, it's a live vaccine and it does actually land in our spinal cord. So you can get zoster. Uh, I think we think that the rate is lower, but you unfortunately still can get zoster, even if you have not had um, chicken pox ever, but you've just received the vaccine, you can still, you're still at risk for zoster. And so you, you should, if you're immunocompromised, get the herpes zoster vaccine. Um, after age 18, and you should get the, uh, if you're not immunocompromised at 50, you should get the herpes zoster vaccine at that time. Could you talk, you mentioned the word catch-up vaccine, I think it was in the context of HPV. Um, and can you talk a little bit about catch-up vaccine and, and more ge ger generally about uh, um, HPV vaccines after the age of 26? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, Catch up means that you, uh, so, you know, the ACI, ACIP basically puts together their recommendations on, you know, at two months, you should do this, at four months, you should do this. And they have a very clear regimen, but not everyone, uh, for a number of reasons, may not. Uh, you know, maybe they're coming from another country uh, where it's slightly different. Uh, there's many reasons why they may not have had the vaccines at the time that the ACIP recommends it. So we're the board of people who decide when vaccines should be given. Um, and so you can get vaccines later and that's basically called catching up. Uh, and I think as you, I might've used the word catch up, but people, people are saying this hepatitis B um, is now like allowing catch up for everyone under the age of 60 so that we're allowing people to have the benefit of this vaccine that, um, uh, even though they they were not babies uh, when we're giving it. So we're giving it now to all babies and have been for 30 years, but we're catching all adults up basically up to the age of 60. And the reason uh, for 
for, for not over is that we know that people have lower risks of, a, of acquiring hepatitis B after that time. Uh, so that was why catch up for hep B and for HPV. So HPV is a sexually transmitted disease primarily. Um, and uh, so we, we try to give it before someone's sexual debut if possible, uh, because uh, it's it's best uh, to get people before they're exposed to the types of HPV that um, that the, that the vaccine prevents against. So we, uh, um, if they don't get it, you know, um, as a preteen, we then can give it afterwards. Uh, you can get it. Um, so up until age, they recommend catch up, catch up until age twenty six, um, because. Uh, but, you know, like everybody doesn't have the same life plan uh, and you might, you know, maybe you were, maybe you married your childhood sweetheart and then you get a divorce and you're, you know, 30, uh, you know, people do get vac the, the HPV vaccine at that time because they're like, well, I am going to date and I uh, may be exposed to more types and I don't think I've been exposed yet. So, um, and you can choose to get the, hepat the HPV uh, vaccine if you like, you kind of have to work it out with your pharmacist and, and insurance company. They don't always cover it for not like by the book recommendations. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, but people do catch up the vaccine for like why they need it for their life. And until age 26, when it's sort of like they um, maybe we haven't uh, been exposed to um, to the HPV strain. And also um, uh, HPV was this, you know, so cervical cancer. The thing we're mostly trying to prevent from HPV is actually, you know, was a disease of very young women. We actually stop H like screening for cervical cancer at the age of 65 because we know that the rates go down and it requires like 10 years uh, to develop cervical cancer from, from getting HPV. Um, uh, and again, most cervical cancer, even if you do get cervical cancer, it's very treatable, very preventable. So just getting your pap smear and taking out the abnormal cells or monitoring them carefully is often enough. Um, but uh, but we do allow people. So that's what catch up meant in that uh, sort of a long winded, but basically it means getting the vaccine, not at the time when ACIP told you to do it, uh, but the, we're still giving you the benefit of getting the vaccine just a little bit later. Uh, two other excellent questions. Um... Uh, I'll, I'll say this one, uh, I'll quote it directly because it's uh, right on target. Did I hear it right? There is a once for all pneumococcal vaccine for people older than 65. Yeah, yeah, it's once for all for everybody. It's crazy. It's great. Because <laughs> uh, like, the, so the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations were quite complicated, especially having to give this PPSV23 every five years and now um, the PCV20, um, if you get it, it results in a better immune response. So it, um, and you know, mind you, every time we do this, there there may be data in the future where we'll tell you something different and ACVI people will come back and be like, actually, we wanna do this, you know, PCV40 next time or something. Uh, but for now, it's right that they, uh, they say one and done for PCV20. So if you give it once, that you don't have to do another pneumococcal vaccine. And if you're over the age of 65, you just do it that, and you don't have any immunocompromising condition, you do it once at 65 and you're done. If you have immunocompromising conditions, you can actually do it earlier than that. And you do PCV20 and you're done, uh, which is very different from what the uh, recommendations were before. And can you say the uh, brand name for PCV20? Uh, Oh, gosh, I forgot it right now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have asked it that way. Prevnar. Prevnar. Sorry. Yeah. I just, it came sorry. out of my head when you said it. <laughs> sorry about that. Just so <laughs> some people think of it as Prevnar, uh, and uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, oh, an additional question is, um, this is a, a very common uh, question that comes up in the office. Should you get the shingles vaccine, even if you have had a case of shingles? And I'll uh, uh, amplify that by saying, how soon after a case of shingles should you get the shingles vaccine? Just about Prevnar. So you have to say the 20 for the Prevnar because there was a Prevnar 13. So just to know that you still have to say the two zero. And that, was, that, that, that when you say Prevnar 20, you mean um, all 20 strains, but the 13 had less. So you can think of the 13 as being, you know, the one, the older one, right? Because they didn't have as many strains in there. And now the 20 has more and that's why it's one and done. Uh, so shingles. Uh, so yeah, shingles, 
when you, um, so you definitely should get the shingles vaccine, even if you've had shingles, um, because you can get it again. Um, you are, uh, so like, you know, really what's happening when you get shingles. So, um, your body is sort of telling you that you forgot about this chicken pox vaccine that you've been keeping controlled in your spinal cord for a long period of time. And, you know, before there was a chicken pox vaccine, your body was remembering chicken pox a lot because your grandkids got chicken pox. And so it had an opportunity to be like, oh yeah, chicken pox. I remember that. Don't want that again. And your body would sort of have a immune response and would naturally have this immunity. But now that nobody gets shingle, nobody gets chicken pox, uh, shingles has become more common. Um, so the, um, when you get the, when shingles comes out, your immune system has, it re is remembers, oh yes, chicken pox, put that back where it's supposed to be. And you actually get, uh, better immunity because you were exposed because, you know, it came out, your own type of chicken pox came out and so your immune system was exposed to that. So, um, you don't have to do it right away. It also kind of depends on what your level of immune function is. So if you were, uh, more immunocompromised, um, you might say like, okay, you know, four weeks after I got shingles, um, uh, I'm going to get the vaccine. So I never want to have that happen again. Um, if you're immunocompromised, you can probably wait longer, uh, you know, like a couple of months, uh, there's no strict guideline. Um, uh, it still works to decrease the risk of, uh, of shingles, even if you've had shingles before. Excellent. Maybe uh, a final question would be if you could say a few words about malaria uh, and what the future, present and future is related to malaria vaccines. Yeah, so malaria is a obviously devastating illness, um, and there um, there are malaria vaccines. Um, they are uh, it's sort of we're we're working on um, you know getting that to everybody who needs it. Uh, so there there certainly are vaccines that are available. Uh, they are. Uh, not sort of universally, they're not, they're not sort of ready for prime time in some way. They're still like working on getting it to everyone that needs it and all that. Uh, but this is like a, a huge priority, uh, especially for the World Health Organization to, um, uh, cause you know, so many children across the developing world die of malaria, um, every year. Fantastic. I think on that note, uh, we'll call it an evening. And again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for doing this.